One of the major mental health problems that the world conceives it has, certainly in the United States, is the effects of trauma, which has now been extended to intergenerational trauma. Today, we're going to talk about how the Life Process Program directly confronts intergenerational trauma. And we're going to do it with I want perhaps the starkest example of what you might call the source of intergenerational trauma when a parent commits suicide. So let's start with Phil Spector. I'll jump ahead. He died in prison. He was a survivor who was ruined. And as a part of my ongoing research, as you know, Zach, I'm constantly investigating new information. There's currently a four-part documentary on Showtime. At the age of 19, Phil Spector had a number one hit worldwide. And the title of that hit was, To Know, No, No, Him is to Love, Love, Love Him. Just to see him smile makes my life worthwhile. And that inscription is on his father's tombstone. His father committed suicide. To know him was to love him. And then Phil Spector went on to be Phil Spector. He did Be My Baby. He did The River Deep Mountain High. Uh, he did Let It Be. He produced the Let It Be album with the Beatles. Um, they credited him with a phenomenon in the studio called The Wall of Sound, which yes. the, the Grateful he Dead named the their music literal music. sound after. Yeah, right. And then he killed... A woman he invited over to his mansion in Hollywood or wherever, and he died in prison in 2021. One person I was really fascinated to see in the documentary was a woman named Annette Kindbard, whose name I didn't know, but I, I was aware of to know him was to love him, is to love him. And I was aware there was a woman singer. And the way that worked out was Phil Spector was in high school. He, I, he was in the choir with her, he sang with her. He knew that she had extremely flexible register. Mm. And it's to know, no, no, Mr. Love, Love, Love him. And I do. And then I really love him. You have to switch to a whole other register. So I don't, you know, just imagine so much of life is so amazing. So imagine you're in high school. And this little runny guy comes up to you and says, you know, I know you can sing in a couple of registers. I've written a song uh, from my father's tombstone, and I've got a recording studio in Hollywood on Saturday. Uh, can you record this song? And, and, and that Klein Bard, who I didn't know, is a normal human being. And Phil Spector, for better or for worse, is not a normal human being. And so it went on to become the number one hit. And then they went on in those days, you would go on the Ed Sullivan show. And before they went on stage, Phil Spector went up to her. He put his arm against her throat and partly strangled her and said, if you miss that high soprano part, I'm going to kill you. Huh. Um, Annette Kleinbart, I, I, I was fascinated to see her because she grew up with Phil Spector. She knew his mother and sister. And she said she couldn't bear to be at their house because they were constantly screaming and fighting. She, as I said, she was like a normal person with a normal family. I don't know. She came home and her mother said, oh, do you want some cookies and milk? And that wasn't the way the Spector family went. Further into the documentary, she's in the car listening to the radio, and she hears herself. It's not herself. What Phil Spector would do would be he'd, he had a voice in mind. He'd find especially women singers. He'd slot them into that voice because he knew what he – I mean, Phil Spector was a genius, an oral genius. And so – what did, how do you react to hear your whole, well, maybe I'll be a great singer, a superstar. Oh, Phil Spector's replaced me with somebody 
whose voice can do the same thing. Mm. For Spector, women singers were cogs. And not only women singers, he did the biggest ASCAP moneymaker in the 20th century was You've Lost That Loving Feeling by the Righteous Brothers. Phil Spector made them up. They were men. They had a sound that he could use. What kind of human being are we talking about? Specter was mean. Specter never counted other human beings. Um, there's a, I've seen more than one um, documentary about Specter. Uh, Specter actually had some friends, and one of them was John Lennon. John Lennon's death really broke him up. And there's part of a video where Martin Scorsese has done Mean Streets, the movie. And he's ripped off Phil Spector's soundtrack. And he wrote them him saying, you know, I made this movie with no budget and I've used your songs. Could you let me use them for $250? And Spector goes, oh man, we'll squeeze this guy. And John Lennon, who's more of a human being, says, you know, you and I were just starting out at one point. You know, cut the guy a break, don't you? So this is a quote from the um, documentary. Spectre's old friends or co-workers still wonder where things went wrong. With evident pain, Paul Schaefer, you know, the musical director for yeah. the old Dave Letterman show, yeah. recalls wanting to see Spectre in prison and being told he didn't want visitors. Phil Spectre wanted to die alone in prison. Whew. So let's turn to another case of parental suicide that sort of nobody knows about, but you can't erase a suicide. So to remind us how that was the case of parental suicide. His father committed suicide. Um, ESPN had a series called 30 by 30, and they did something called the Book of Manning in 2013. 30 for 30, yeah. 30 for 30, thank you. Yep. And I was transfixed by it. I was transfixed by it. I mean, I sort of knew who the Mannings were, it was a child rearing manual. Um, Archie Manning was a kind of maybe semi all pro quarterback for the New Orleans Saints. He played 13 years. He was a scrambling quarterback. He not only did he never win the Super Bowl, they never even made the playoffs while he was their starting quarterback, but everybody loved him. Um, <clears throat> he returned from the front. He went to, he's, he was, a famous college football player. He returned in his freshman summer from Old Miss and he found his father dead in his bedroom. He had shot his brains out with the shotgun. Now, what would every current therapist tell people to do in that circumstance? To isolate and seclude that person from challenges. They would say, you have to enter trauma therapy. Yeah. And Archie Manning was a good son. I think he had a younger sister. He said to his mother, well, I'll drop out of college. And his mother, she's the star of the book of Manning, even though I don't think you see her. She said, no, go back to college. And everything that I'm going to talk about that's followed, follows from that. <clears throat> and I know that would be your, if you had some student who had some family tragedy and they had a scholarship to Juilliard, I'm just making that off the top of my head, you would say it would amplify the tragedy to turn off your life now, to cut it off because of what your father's limitations were. And the, the movie, the show implied that his father couldn't deal with his son's fame. He married Olivia and had three sons, Archie Manning. His three sons are Cooper, Eli, and Peyton. Um, two of those people won Super Bowl, two Super Bowls each. One went to college. He wasn't a quarterback, Cooper, and he was injured in his first year. And, you know, I didn't know much about I've seen Cooper on TV a lot. <clears throat> He's hilarious. He's the most verbal of the sons. Um, but I sort of said, boy, that's, what a trauma. He was a receiver. He was an all-American. He was going to be an all-American. Did you say what a, what a trauma? 
What's that? Did you, did you say what a trauma? He he had he developed some kind of an orthopedic Ill, illness, yeah, I don't know, yeah. disease, and he couldn't play football. Yep. And here your brothers are famous, your younger brothers. What's going to happen to you? And here's what happened to him. Cooper Archibald Manning is an American entrepreneur and television personality who is the host of the television show, The Manning Hour, for Fox Sports. He never played college football, but he's got the show as well as principal and senior managing director of investor relations for AJ Capital Partners. Wow. All of the brother, three brothers, all of them work together. Um, <clears throat> Cooper and, and somehow I watched them a lot. I, I couldn't even tell you. I, I didn't even know when College Bowl was on. Cooper and Peyton are co-hosts of the College Bowl, where these smart college kids answer questions. And you know you have to be verbal. You have to under, You have to know how to pronounce. You know you have to have, have your head in the game to do that show. And then my favorite show, Eaton, Eli and Peyton do a commentary on Monday Night Football on ESPN, and I love it. I love it for three reasons. Um, obviously, they're extremely knowledgeable. Two, I love to see the interplay between them. They kind of jibe each other. And they're different. Uh, Peyton is just more analytical and talk about and talkative. You know, uh, Eli's kind of lower key. And then they have two guests on, you know, more uh, first half and second half, two guests each time. And everybody loves Peyton Manning, which I, I guess I had no opinion about that. For example, they had Robin Roberts on, who's a woman sportscaster. And Peyton says, I have a bone to pick with you. When you interviewed uh, Tom Brady, you said that you never were so nervous. How come you know, aren't nervous <laughs> interviewing me? Yeah. And her answer was, oh, you're in my comfort zone. Yeah. I mean, he's human. She's okay. with. She's relaxed with him. I mean, he's one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. But, and he's, but he's human. I mean, that, that's like the whole family. They're not a football family. Right. Even though they are, they're not. They're a family, yeah, the many of whom part. play football. And let me, I'll turn to that exact quote. <clears throat> in the book of Manning, at the end, they show Archie Manning and they say, people ask me, how do you raise a quarterback, a professional quarterback? And he goes, you don't raise a quarterback, you raise a child. Mm. And here's the five rules. That's one rule for how to raise children. Now, remember. Archie Manning's father committed suicide and he discovered him and he might have done it because he felt inadequate compared to his son. Remember that. And Archie Manning's mother said, go back to college and become Archie Manning. And then you have three sons. Let's see how you deal with them. He accepts each child in the book of Manning as he is. If Eli Manning is kind of a Sphinx-like proposition, he would say, you know, I often don't know what Eli's thinking. So um, Peyton went to Tennessee instead of going to Mississippi, which is where Archie and went and Cooper went. And he never told them which college he had made. He had decided to go to. And Archie Manning sort of never asked him. Well, mm. what does that indicate to you about how Archie Manning viewed his son? It shows trust in his son and shows that he's no understands that just by the way that he's grown up is an achievement oriented person who's going to shoot straight. I mean, obviously Archie Manning knows a lot about colleges and football. Yeah. And the university of Mississippi was leaning on him. Is, is, is he like coming here? And so he had to say, I don't know. All three boys and the family, they all work together and support one another. On those various shows, not everybody can have three boys. They fought a lot when they were kids. So do shows together. All of them are competent and responsible. But, you know, but you can tell by you don't win a Super Bowl unless you know how to do that. And then Cooper has whatever all those accomplishments are. And then the last thing they have is generosity and humility. When Peyton Manning's on a show. He's on with competitors. 
uh, guys he played against, guys on his team. He's always totally gracious to them. It's, I marvel at how he does it. He, you know, he'll maybe tell a joke. I'll remember the time you missed a tackle on me, but it's never a put down. And I think you gave this answer. They're not a bunch of superstar football players. So there's another man in coming along, a high school senior. Cooper's son, Arch, plays quarterback at Isidore Newman School, the same school where his father and uncles played, and is the top-ranked pro-style quarterback prospect in the class of 2023. How is that possible? I mean, his father wasn't a quarterback. Is quarterbacking really a genetic thing? <laughs> I mean, he is six foot four. <clears throat> and I've never seen his uncles or his father discuss Arch Manning on television. You know, they don't want to get into his life. And, you know, he's already, if you're the number one choice, you're already under the spotlight. Right. I mean, they must have shown him how to throw a football. And, you know, maybe you'll ask some questions. But I have seen a documentary about Arch Manning. And everybody talks about his maturity, his graciousness, how he gives credit to the other players, how yeah. when they fall behind, he doesn't panic. He's learned that from his family. Right. It's leadership qualities that can be instilled, right? Family values. And they don't feel a need to like, they don't have to promo away. There's, right. He's already the number one pick. So I just, um, these are life process program answers. Archie Manning's father committed suicide. His mother told him, <clears throat> go back to school, become an All-American, become a pro raise a family, use the values that you've learned, accept each child, you know, your kids are going to be different, be very supportive and work together, teach them to be competent and responsible, and make them generous and humble, you know, don't make them big blowhards. Let me circle so, all the way back. Um, so you mentioned at the top that there's buzz all over about trauma and transgenerational trauma there, there's somebody will necessarily be affected by something traumatic that has happened in previous generations and then but at the same time that doesn't have to be the case something that is traumatic doesn't have to even affect one person's life in an overall negative way it could be some something that they experience uh, some positive outcomes from and then those values can be passed down just the same so what's up with the juxtaposition? You talked about Phil Spector at the beginning, and then you talked about the Manning family, both of whom at one point in the family tree, there was a suicide involved and they went miraculously. The father of the, 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 the seminal characters committed suicide. Right. And Phil Spector didn't have the human resources to overcome that. He didn't have the mental health conditions or the stability in his home to develop fully as a human being. <clears throat> And in fact, some people psychoanalytically say he hated women. And his mother and his sister never understood the Phil Spector gig. What's he doing? Mm. Uh, who knew you, you're going to become Phil Spector? Archie Manning's mother said it's, uh, that it was implied that his father was insecure around his son. Archie Manning's mother said, just be who you were going to be. Carry forward your life. Develop your skills. Express your values, follow your own life process, as opposed to fomenting around the trauma. And God, you know, it's a tragedy. His father, they never mention his father again in the book of Manning, other than in the beginning, because they're too busy. I mean, they've got three kids and a bunch of grandkids, and they're playing professional football, and he's got a bunch of other grandkids. They're too busy living their life, trying to manifest who they are and what they want life to be like for the following generations. They almost intentionally cut up, made a Chinese wall is a phrase I use in law, between that event 
and going forward, right. raising a family and life skills. And, and all, by the way, all three sons are married and none has ever been divorced. It's a beautiful metaphor, by the way, that's, that's how you run an offense too. You know, the most successful quarterbacks, if you ever see Tom Brady or Peyton Manning or Eli Manning get sacked, uh, they're not crying and giving up and fumbling the ball the next play. They're moving the offense along the next play. It's sort of like as the family values version of quarterbacking, like this, this horrible thing happened and I, I'm going to have to you know, contend with it, but in some ways I need to resolve it in whichever way that I decide to resolve it. And the way that the Mannings chose to do that throughout their family is push forward, you know, do things that are valuable, do things that are life enhancing. And they had a little example of that when they did that documentary about Arch Manning um, in some giant state championship, they fell behind in the first half, a player dropped the ball and they said, he just went up to the guy, he pat him on the shoulder. We'll get him the next half. Um, let's keep focus. He's, you know, how he was 17 years old. How does he know how to do that? <laughs> and it's just what you said. He's not a professional quarterback, but when they make him the number one ranked guy, it's because they're looking at his emotional fabric along with his, you know, his skill set. And they say, this guy's going to do it. And That's so that- the life process program is an answer to intergenerational trauma. Yeah, let's tie that together just in a beautiful bow at the end. There are, it seems like when it comes to people who, um, who make the trauma case, there are more Phil Spectors out there than there are Nannings. I, I'm not saying there really are more. I'm saying that when this conversation you comes up, about. it's saturated, right? That, and um, I've talked, I talked to somebody recently who signed up for our program who t- actually described to me that he's had trauma in his life since he was young, but he doesn't think of it that way. He, one of the things about AA is that he joined and thought, well, it's nice to be around people. And he thought, wait a minute, it's not to be nice to be around these people because they're all talking about all their traumas, this sucks. So I, he said, I started the program and something that I like about it is that it validates what I've been thinking. I don't really have good parental supervision, never did. Um, I don't know if I have all the social resources, but one thing that LPP is giving me is an ability to sort of articulate the stuff on my own from beginning to end. And I'm talking it out with somebody so I can build my own resources. And you also give them optimism. You're not your, when you deal with kids in LPP or you deal with kids at school, you believe in them. You assume they're going to overcome it. You feel they can. A confidence along with, you know, energy and uh, the directing your attention to your life are the two key elements. You might imagine that if Archie Manning decided to put a ceiling on his own ability because he felt traumatized. I mean, what would the world, what would the world of Mannings have been, you know? But Can you I guess- imagine if they did an annual, t- if they just got into a total family trauma thing? It's, right. it's like some bizarro, scary movie. Right. So we, we, offer, we believe that the world is, mental health world is going wrong. We believe that. We believe there's more mental disorientation and more problems by following the trauma orientation we're offering an alternative that we feel is a direct antidote to the problems that we're encountering. Nicely done, Stanton. Thank you so much. Thanks for the juxtaposition too. And what I'm realizing right now is that when this comes out, it'll be Christmas. So Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.